He didn't say, I am here, a man of God, and I bring this provision for you to help you. What did he say? Hey, what you got? What do you got? What you got, girl? She's like, I just got this little bit of oil. Asking kids what they even think about money. They might not have any opinions on it until you start having conversations with them. And then they'll come up with creative ideas and you'll be like, oh my gosh, my child's five years old and listen to this great idea. There's entrepreneurs, there's kids on social media right now that are making millions of dollars on their content. Instead of you no good, dirty little son of a... <laughs> and how many times a kid that you never gonna be nothing. You so dumb, you dumber than a fence post. How many times do parents say that? potentially, not even really thinking about it. And what they're doing is that they are then reassuring you're dumb as a fence post. You may not be where you wanna be with your finances right now. You may be living paycheck to paycheck, but you can change your kids. Well, and future, yours right at now. the same time. Yeah. It could be a double whammy. Dad, can I get a new skateboard? No. Dad, can I get a new bike? No. Can I get a used bike? No. Dad? Can I get a Segway? A what? A Segway. No. Dad? Can I get some new running shoes then? Your shoes are fine. Dad? Can we go to the mall? No. How about the movies? No. Can I eat? You just ate. Oh, yeah. Dad? Can I get a new? No. Oh. Dad? Can I get a new baseball bat? What do you think? Money grows on trees? Hey guys! Money does grow on trees! Holy cow! Holy good God almighty! Who are you? I'm Money Mike! With me, money is easy! As easy as counting! One, two, three! Wow! Whoa! No! See the leaves on my tree? I'll teach you and your dad five quick tips on how to get rich like me! Dad, did you hear that? Dad? Welcome to the <laughs> Abundant Life episode where we are talking to each other and not at each other. Oh, this wonderful. is not a marriage counseling session, Couldn't although it be. turns out to be. What are we talking about? Talking about, we're actually going to give five tips to make kids rich. I mean, not totally stupid. <laughs> well, that's kind of what the system does to them. <laughs> want to keep them in poverty. So, that's I mean, so nuts. Well, and that's just the way it is, and that's what happened to us. You know, the system didn't train us, parents didn't train us. So, that's our whole mission here of what we're doing is, you know, trying to help parents to help their kids. And a lot of times, you know, parents want to, yeah, I want my kids to be rich. I want my kids to be successful. I want them to have all the great things in life, but how do I do it? <laughs> You know, it's like, if you haven't been trained, then how do you do it? And that's the whole thing where we wrote the whole book series, Money, Mike, and the Gang, and on giving basically parents, teachers, grandparents a tool to start that process. So important. So, you know, the number one thing that we talk about, so we're saying, what's the, okay, what's the five tips to make my kids rich? Well, number one is, got to change this right here. What's in between those ears? Go change your mind. You got to have the right mindset. Kids, teens, adults. I think everyone needs to hear this message. <laughs> you need to hear it over and over. Yeah. Because your mind is continually being formed by the things going on around you. Things in your school, the things on the news, the thing on social media, all of these things that are constantly bombarding. The Bible says that do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By And how do you renew your mind? By reading the Bible, getting good teachings, listening to good things from pastors, preachers, teachers that are going to encourage you that Jesus became poor, that so you'd be made rich. Well, how do you do, okay, so we're talking about five tips for kids. So how do you do that for kids? Like what's the best, what's the best way to do that for children? To set the mindset? Yeah, like even, if, okay, so if a kid's like two or, mm -hmm. you know, what's the best thing for them? Well, that's the book series. I mean, this book series is like, we designed it for two to eight. Right. So depending on where they're at, when you get this books, when you get this teaching, it's like, you can Im implement it any time in there. And like what I always say is that even parents, when they're reading this and using this, it's good, they're gonna learn something too. So yeah. it's really, you could say, these are books are for all ages. You know, and this, the whole podcast that we're doing is not about 
the books in itself. It's about giving people information on how to utilize the books or how to just get information to, to change your mindset that you actually do have the ability to change your kids entire future. And it's not just your kids, but it's your grandkids. It's their kids, their children, their children's children. It's all the way down for future generations. But somebody has got to stand up in the family and say, I'm going to make a change. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I think people, you know, they'll want to complain. I say, when you complain, you remain, or when you make excuses, you're basically lying to yourself. Well, I grew up, you know, in this poverty section of town. I grew up on, you know, this way I was saying on the wrong side of the tracks, or it's like, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. Well, get up on the other side, you know, move to the other side. It's not about location geographical. It's about this and change this. I don't care where you grew up. I don't care what your circumstances are. I mean, we're classic examples of not coming from money, not coming from a good education on the area of finances. And we're able to make a change in our life. Unfortunately, it was when we were in our thirties, but fortunately we made it then instead of in our fifties or sixties. So it's a matter of choice. You know, we were talking about last time we were sharing our story and you know, we talked about at one point after we were bankrupt and lost everything, everything, no place to live, had to move into your parents' basement, no cars, no bank accounts, no anything. And then we talked about that I was homeless living in my car. Well, I actually wasn't homeless because I had a car, so I couldn't class it, but I say more appropriately, I was living out of my car. And we think, oh my gosh, it's like so bad or homeless is so bad. And I was thinking about that this morning in my prayer time. It's like, I was, homeless. I was living in my car by choice. And the difference was, is that I never saw myself poor living in that car. I saw myself as an opportunity to increase and to move forward in the area of my business. And I was doing that. I was sacrificing that really because I had to, because I didn't have the money <laughs> to have a place to live or to have a motel room or whatever. Maybe I didn't have that ability to do that, but that didn't limit my mind. I was thinking I'm moving forward. I'm working. I'm working on this deal. I'm helping my partners. I'm doing this. I was thinking I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. I wasn't in self pity in the circumstance that I was in. And so I wonder how many people that are actually homeless on the street who've made that choice. Think about it. Well, that's the thing. Like you'll never really know and how you're not to judge anyone. Well, and, and it can be when the other thing I was thinking about, it could be a chronological choices or, uh, like a number of choices that they made and not that they made it to get to be homeless, but bad decisions that led them to that. Right. But then when they get there, then where's the mindset at that point to just be basically okay with being there? Well, and you can talk about the poor will always be with us. It's a bad example, but how do you get information into the ones who are in poverty for them to change their mind? Because if you're stuck, you're stuck. You don't have, I mean, you're in your environment. So like what you're saying is so important to get this into children early, especially for parents, for their kids. Because if we had this, if our parents were speaking this over us when we were two, what a total game changer that would have been for our lives. Just in so many ways of increase. But my question is, okay, so you've got, you know, homeless people who are making choices and they're stuck in this environment and they, they don't know how to get this information to them. Like, what do you suggest for something like that? Other than ministries going out into the world and, you know, getting books and Bibles and trying to, you know, give people things. So your question is, how do you get homeless out of homelessness? <laughs> how do you change the mentality if they're stuck in an environment? Like, how do you, how do you change that environment? I just told you, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind has to be renewed. That's the whole point that I'm making right here about you have to establish a mindset for the children. So then you build upon that mindset. So you have to put a positive mindset. So the most important thing that you can do as a parent is to speak positively. There it is. Right. Over your children. Right. You know, and not like I was just talking about, you know, when you complain, you remain, oh man, you know, I grew up, it was so bad. It was so bad. <laughs> and I was like, I had to walk uphill to school and we didn't have nothing to eat for weeks. You I know? think every single child in the world 
has a negative thing to say about how they were raised. <laughs> well, to a certain extent. But my point is, is to look at the positive side of things. And you can say that about every single thing in life and everything that comes at you. Absolutely. It's just how you look at it. That's why Proverbs says that, you know, out of your mouth can, can come either life or death. Right. You can speak either life or death. So any, anytime that you're talking about all the negative stuff, anytime you're complaining, you're talking death. Here. How many times a day do you catch yourself? Now? Yeah. Not very much. I do catch myself occasionally. And I think more so in the area probably of business because you're trying to deal with things logically. Like right now we're dealing with the lawsuit. So it's like trying to logically work your way through that with the attorneys or whatever it is, but still do it by faith. Still knowing you're already victorious in it, but still having to make the steps of making the logical decisions to protect yourself from a legal perspective because you're in the system, you're dealing with the system, but declaring your favor over the situation and that you're already victorious even though you're in the worldly system because you're in another kingdom. Seeing an opportunity, it's absolutely an opportunity. And that's how you have to see it. No matter what comes your way, there's well, an opportunity there. And we talked about that last time. We talked about the difference between growth and development. Right. You know, how do you grow in business, we talked about constantly changing our contracts to protect ourselves. What happens when the contract maybe doesn't protect yourself or it's frivolous that they're overlooking the, the facts that you had yourself protected and they're still trying to get you. Or A, it's frivolous, and how do you deal with that? Well, you can deal with it a couple different ways. One, you can get pissed off and complain, <laughs> you know. So easy to easy. do. Or you, so can, easy. or you can be positive. And, right. you know, I was thinking about this the other day, it's like King David, never would have been King David without Goliath. Think about that. Why? Because he had to defeat the giant. I mean, mm -hmm. that's when he stepped out as a teenager, you know, said that he was, he was ready, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he is just skinny, you know? He had everything in the physical realm working against him. But what did he have? He's like, you defied my Lord. Right. <laughs> he had faith, right. you know? And without that victory, and I, I was gonna go back and review because he was questioning them. Well, what do I get if I do this? And then they say like, you don't have to pay taxes, I think. I'm paraphrasing this, wasn't it? You don't have to pay taxes to the king and you're gonna get like the king's daughter. And I forget exactly what that is, but there was like a reward. He was like, okay, that's a good incentive, man. No taxes, like, oh, well, let me fight the giant right. for no taxes. Right. So it's that positive mindset that we're going back to is, you know, establishing that in kids. So speaking good things about them. The Bible also says, call those things that be not as though they were. You may not be a millionaire, but start calling it. Right. That's faith. Right. That's faith. So calling your kids, you know what? You're a champion. You're so successful. How many times do we say that to our daughter in tennis and just her career after even tennis and now even that she's a professional athlete playing pickle, how much do we still speak positive things and encourage her over that? And it's most important to do that in a time where maybe they're going through a struggle or their experience potential defeat right and that's what i that's do when i'm like yeah. you know on the sidelines with her or helping through anything it's like i'm not giving her strategies on how to win a match i'm just reinforcing who she is right hey you're a champion you can do this come on you got this you got it come on yeah i got this i got this. it's not, it's not Hey, you need to stand over here with this foot this way and put the ball over this way it's like technicality and, and is not gonna nothing's work nothing's wrong with that but from that perspective of battle, my point is, is that, you know, speaking those positive things. I mean, you can do that just with our kids in life. Hey, going to school today. Hey, you know what? You're an A student. You do good. You're always listening good. You're always respectful. You always do a good job. Keep it up. Instead of, you no good, dirty little son of a... <laughs> and how many times a kid that? You're never going to be nothing. You so dumb. You dumber than a fence post. How many times do parents say that, potentially? not even really thinking about it and what they're doing is that they are then reassuring you're dumb as a fence post so what's that kid hearing because the bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing right. ing plural and hearing the word of christ it's hearing it's hearing over and over and over and over it's hearing the good news it's hearing the good good news that jesus came to bring which is what i'm gonna liberate liberate all of you from poverty <laughs> from sickness and disease from you know, unrighteousness, that you have righteousness from all the things that are part of the curse in Deuteronomy 28. He's redeemed us from all of that. That's right. the good news. So the good news is too, is that your child's been liberated, set free from being dumb, from being broke, from being all that crap. Right. You know, so reinforce it. 
I am in agreement with that. Um, so when this lawsuit came, the opportunity for me was to actually pray for that person and their business to increase more and more. And I was actually seeing them prospering more abundantly that whatever is wrong would be made right. Cause it's totally, you know, up to the Lord to put it on someone's heart. Do you know what I mean? So for us, it's like, think, oh, it's frivolous because we're protected under a contract. Well, let's just put the contract out mm -hmm. right now. And it's just a lawsuit. So why, why is somebody really trying to sue somebody? What are they trying to get? My, in my opinion, it's a projection of something that they're upset. Cause usually, you know, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Isn't not the desires that burn within you. It's something that's going on in this person's life that has to project all this hatred and lawsuits and frivolousness and, um, which, well, let me paraphrase it. It's a projection is my, yes. Yeah, like you big old dummy, you're doing all that crap and you're trying to blame somebody else for it. And you're not taking responsibility for your own life. Right. <laughs> which you can see in every argument that you have. So really? if you have a problem with anybody or you're judging anyone, it could be anything. Oh, look at that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's your own desire inside of you because you're not this, you're not that. And it's a rewind or a replay of, like you said, what maybe you have heard the time that you were growing up to who you are now as an adult, which begins to act out into other things. So the Bible says to pray for your enemies. So do you consider them an enemy in this? <laughs> <laughs> I would say any opposing party, uh, you know. Oh, you're so righteous. <laughs> Thank you for praying for them. I, won't go. I know, but that's the thing. So <laughs> if you are righteous, then start acting righteous. I heard a really great one liner saying, and it said that stop longing for something and start being. What's that mean to you? It means start being who you th want to be. If you're righteous, then start acting righteous. Start being righteous. And yeah. what are those righteous things? Well, it's, you know, doing the right things, doing what you know is right to do. So start doing right things. But the important thing first is knowing that you're righteous. You're not trying to do those right things to become righteous. No, you you're are. already righteous. So when you believe right, that's why I love what Joseph Prince always says. He says, when you believe right, you'll act right. Right. Not act right first and then once you act right then we'll deem you as holy and righteous and that's what the church sometimes i think wants to do is like hey man get yourself cleaned up and then when you do then come back and we'll accept you because the church wants to condemn people for their wrong acts too it's like i mean when they, they say, preach well, fire and brimstone when well, you say come as you are and then they come as you are and they say well you know what you got a lot of sin in your life man you need to get your act cleaned up you know for you know before we accept you let you Everyone in here needs to get their like, act cleaned up nobody's perfect <laughs> well and that's the point is that right. it's like do you take a bath before you take a bath no you take a bath you get cleaned up well i have to ask you sometimes like why are you cleaning the house before the maids come i mean that's like okay we're getting all something here <laughs> <laughs> Marriage counseling. <laughs> We're talking from a spiritual perspective, not from a house cleaning perspective. It translates though. Okay. Okay. So speaking positive words over your kids. It's so that's, important. It's so, so important. That's, I think, one of the keys of establishing that good mindset is that you have to know, just like we said, you have to know you're righteous. You have to know that you're, that you're good. Right. You have to know that you've got potential. You have to know that. You're smart because every kid's got something in them. Every kid has got a gift in them. Right. And the thing that I, that, you know, just, I just hate to see sometimes is like these medications. It's like, let's give this, this kid's got ADD or has got this or that. Let's give him this medication to try to dull that down. Let's just dope him up. You know, it's like the very thing that they may be trying to suppress may be that kid's gift. Elon Musk. Ashburgers. I you mean, do they try to give him drugs? Um, I don't know his whole story, <laughs> but if they're being diagnosed as something and you want to medicate your children, look at the brilliance that came forth from it. You could say that about anything, yeah. but I think it's, I think parents sometimes think it's too difficult for them. So how do you help somebody who thinks it's so difficult? They just want to medicate the kid because it's really alleviating the problem, which, Hey, Prescription can be a nice bridge for some people, but it shouldn't be your final destination, like debt and other things. Well, I have to really question is like, for a young kid, 
do they really need to be given pharmaceutical stuff? I mean, how much issues could they really have from a, from a mental perspective? I mean, I, I'm not saying this about all kids. Right. I'm not saying this about every kids. I'm saying this about most kids. So there, are there gonna be cases where they need some? Yeah, absolutely. But every single time something turns around, you gotta give them a drug to try to suppress it. Because like I said, that very thing could be their gift or their talent trying to come out. And it's just misunderstood. Well, there's also scripture. You can back up you know, scripture with any of your things. Like we we're going through the whole communion thing with Joseph Prince. If you are taking medication, take your communion at the same time and knowing that you'll be able to wean off that stuff. And then there's scripture that says, I will drink poison and it will not affect me. So if you're on chemotherapy, you can actually pray the scripture and see yourself whole and it won't affect you like some other people that chemo would affect. But you have to know the scriptures. You have to know what belongs to you. You have to know, you have to read, you have to understand who you are. Because if you've been healed, then you ain't trying to get it. You just gotta be, instead of longing, you just need to be. You yeah. need to just remain in who you are in Christ and stay in that space knowing, hey, I am healed. So then you see yourself healthy. And then you see yourself not being on any treatments or medication. And you see yourself, I mean, I could go on. That's good stuff. Yeah. So what's two? Get, getting some extra credit here. <laughs> Not even tied to kids. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, that was a one. <laughs> so, okay, let's so, something You said something. So we're talking a little bit about gifts, okay? Identifying our kids' gifts and not misidentifying them. Um, one of the challenges we had with our kid is like, you know, we wanted her to be successful and I wanted her to exercise and we wanted her to do stuff. So like two, I started Taekwondo. Wee-yow! It was karate. Ah, whatever. And there's a difference. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I did Taekwondo, so that's why I brought it. But I thought, we're going to teach her discipline and she's going to learn skill and protection. And, ha -ha. <laughs> and she hated it. <laughs> and she didn't like Sabu she, Nim. she got kicked out of that one too, She didn't, didn't like Sabu Nim. <laughs> she said, Sabu Nim, I don't like this. Sabu Nim. <laughs> So we did that for two, three Didn't months. Didn't say like, this is not for her. And we did. She has no discipline. <laughs> we did cheerleading, we did jazz dance, we did piano, and we had all these, the piano teacher brought her by her neck, and we got left of this. So at one point after like five years, I said, what are we doing? Are we like, are we grooming a quitter? Cause it was like, just quit everything. And it was like, okay, don't like that. Okay, go to this next thing. It wasn't necessarily day. that she quit everything. It's just that, People were bringing her back and saying, "Well, get her out of this zone, get her out of that zone, get her out of this well, zone. But the thing is, is that she didn't like it. She'd let us know it. It's like just, she didn't like kindergarten, you know? <laughs> she went to public school for six months, got kicked out for cussing. I got blamed for teaching the cuss, which I never taught the cussing because we didn't cuss at home. But six months there, and every day I'd pick her up from school, how was your day today? Horrible. <laughs> that was it. It's like, this should have been the indicator. We had her in the wrong place. She was five. How was your day today? <laughs> horrible. It was like, <laughs> what do you mean horrible? How horrible could freaking preschool be? So anyway, back to what we're talking about here. Is that we just kept, even though maybe she, it wasn't her intention to quit, she didn't like it. So we were quitting, we were taking her, extracting her from that until right. she finally asked for a tennis racket when she was a fifth birthday or sixth birthday or whatever you know sort five of five <laughs> and then that changed everything okay. so it took that whole time and you're even reading books how to manage the strong-willed children or something <laughs> like that or how to so I just know a strong strong Lord will help me <laughs> because it was a battle I mean that was tough we could have easily that. medicated her right well, I think, I think we, were we, were we were trying to, to medicate, medicate ourselves. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. Gosh, oh we're like, my God. We, we spared we're the telling. child and medicated ourselves. <laughs> it was like, oh, good Lord. The prayer. Oh, okay, that's a whole nother. Thank God a, she's 25 That's now. a whole nother oh my God. teaching on there. We can talk about that later. <laughs> so anyway, whole point about that is finding the gifts. It may take some time. But and there's there, also there listening may, to there your may, children. There may be some challenges and that's okay. Right. Just keep going through it. It's not like you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna have a positive mindset on this and my kids, we're gonna identify their gifts and talents today and we're gonna start on today. It might it's take a process, a yeah. yeah. It might take a process. Just like there's a lot of people who are 
in their teens or their 20s that they're still trying to figure out what's my process, what's my purpose, <laughs> you know? Okay. I mean, I was watching some kids being interviewed on college camps the other day, and they're like two to three years into their education, and the guy was asking him, so what are you, what are you planning to do with your career? What are you, I don't know. It's like, I would say you're three years into your education a majority and how much college. time and money have you spent and you don't even know what are you being educated for? Right. Gen so, general education. Didn't you get enough general education? And if you can, if you know how to read, you can add, subtract, multiply and divide. It's like you got your general education. You got that in junior high. You're ready to go to junior high. <laughs> and then you got extra in high school. You don't need to go pay for it in college too. It's like, here we go. <laughs> I'm getting on a soapbox. So, yeah. We're going to get to this whole thing about school and the values of school. And there are places where I think people do definitely need education. But the point is that when you're going in that to be educated, I think you should know what your purpose and what you want to be trained for so that you're actually getting trained and educated for that. And you're spending your time on money to help you to do that. But sometimes people don't even know in college, in their 20s and their 30s, like they're still trying to identify What's my purpose? Which is important for parents to identify the gifts and talents in their children and to groom them in that. So back to speaking positive things over your children, but also listening to your children, because if they're not, if you're trying to force, like you're trying to, like we were trying to force karate, if it's yeah. not her gig and she's, if there's rebellion in those areas, then you have to listen to the child. Yeah. And sometimes parents don't want to listen to their children. I was just having a conversation with somebody who was I talking to? Oh, one of our friends at pickleball yesterday. I never knew this about Michael. His father was an excellent tennis player and wrote books on tennis and was a tennis coach. Really? And he wanted Michael to play tennis and Michael never, he played football, basketball, <laughs> baseball, rugby. He's like, I played every sport except tennis. <laughs> he's like, I didn't want to play tennis. And he's like, he goes, now looking back at it, probably should have played tennis. He's like, he's 80 years old. And he just had a revelation. He's like, my dad was probably right. You know, but I told him, I said, you know, we grew up in the like national tennis community with kids like the top national players in the country. And how many players did we see kids who parents were like ex college players or ex pros or ex tennis coach or still were tennis coach. And they were basically had groomed their kids to be tennis players. And that you see them be national level tennis players, but by the time they're like 16, 17, they're like, they don't want nothing to do with tennis anymore. Because that wasn't their... It wasn't their passion. It wasn't their thing. Right. So that's another thing that I would suggest to parents to do. You know, don't put your dream, try to put your dream inside your kid and make that their dream. Right. That's if, a good if, one. If, if you have this, if you think you have something where you can help them, like Michael's parents have, you have a gift and a talent and an education, something you can help share with them, share with it, but don't expect that to be their thing. Maybe it is. Maybe they end up being the best at whatever in the world that you weren't able to, but you're able to share that and pass that down. And that's kind of what we're doing with the whole money thing. You know, so the, the thing with the, the going back, just kind of the point I'm trying to make here is the mindset is that even though you as a parent might not know really what your purpose is or what even, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. That's another thing. You can change that in your child's life. That's the whole point of what I'm trying to do here. Just like you may not be where you want to be with your finances right now. You may be living paycheck to paycheck, but you can change your kids. Well, and yours right at now. the same time. Yeah. It could be a double whammy. The whole point is we're changing a lot of things right. in this kid. Just by and getting the, information. And the parent don't have to have it. Right. So, and this is the great thing is that as you're educating your kid to do this, right. you're going to get training too. I mean, I look back at the books too. Sometimes I go, well, that's good. You know, I've taught <laughs> so 10, 10 week financial courses to adults and I can read a adolescent, is that correct term for that? Yeah. Uh -huh. I can read an adolescent book that we put together and I can read it. And I was like, Hey, that's good. That could be, why am I saying it's good? Not because we wrote it. It's good because it's reminded me of something right. going back to what we said earlier, that faith comes by hearing. Right. And hearing the word, it's hearing. It's over and over and over and over. It's not that faith comes because you heard it. You don't hear something one time. Hey, you know what, kid, you're a champion. Okay, I don't have to tell him anymore. Or when we got married, yes, I do, I love you. I don't have to say it ever again. <laughs> I have to keep telling you, I love you, I love you, I love you, right? So that you know that I love you, I love you, right? <laughs> and that's still not enough. <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> Okay, here Off we the go. Marriage thing again. <laughs> Back to the mindset. But yeah, you're right. And a testimony that I love is um, 
Lonnie when he was reading to Ash, Asher. And he called you and said, you know what? This was so good. I had my own revelation when I was reading it to my kid on the tithing portion of, you know, God protecting you from the bad things that may arise or from the bad guys yeah. or whatever. And he's like, it just hit me like, oh. yeah. and cause he had just had an experience losing his wallet. And then that whole big thing about, you know, because well, Lonnie's one of our good friends. Uh, he's a wealth manager. He's helping our family. He's helping our daughter right. manage her wealth. So he knows a lot about money. He's been in the church his whole life. So he's, he, from a spiritual perspective a and, a, and a money perspective, solid. <laughs> you know, you think the last person to have a revelation of a adolescent book about but, money, but he, but he did, yeah. you know, that's a great point. Yeah. It's a really great point. So, okay. So we established, we got to set the mind right. And we can do that as the parent by speaking positive over them and then helping them to learn these things that are going to set their mind okay, so that's on, number one. On, on course because we're trying to eliminate what the world is putting on their minds. And I'm not saying that we put them in a bubble and eliminate that. I'm just saying they're being exposed to that stuff. So can you put a, a restriction to it? Absolutely. Yeah, the world will label you if your parents don't first. So that's the whole thing I think was like, you have to establish a strong enough foundation at home. You got to put the time and the effort into doing that. So when they go out, go, when they go out there that it's like, no, that's not right. No, it's not. It's not right for you to tell me if I feel like I'm a girl, I'm a boy, that's not all right. They should be solid enough to know that right. before you expose them to that potential period. It should be the are. same thing. It's like when it comes to the area of your money, it's like, when you have these foundation, they tell you that, you know, you should use debt and you should, you know, do this and do that. And that doesn't line up with making somebody a wealthy person. They'll be like, I mean, right. <laughs> I know what I taught. I was taught at my home. And my mom and my daddy told me. Or, and then receiving wisdom to make the right choices that fits your lifestyle. And the thing is that, you know, this doesn't just pertain to money. You know, when we talk about prosperity. So I like about third John two's asked me, okay, everything we talked about last time, what, what's like, how do you, how do you paraphrase? I forget what the question you asked me. How do, how does this, if this, if you just one thing you could share, what's right. the most important thing? I said, third John, third John two, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health and your soul prospers. And I already broke all that down, but the whole thing, prosperity from a biblical perspective means your whole life. Just not prosper. We think prosper. Sometimes we think just prospering our money, like we're rich. No, it's being in health. It's having good relationships. It's having peace. It's knowing that you're protected. It's having all those things. So when you establish this in a kid's mindset and from a teaching perspective with money, it's also going to spill over into their health, their peace, their protection. They're going to understand all those That's things. Good. They're going to understand the whole thing. So we're not just focusing on money, but the reason why we're focused on money, because that's what we, that's what our calling is to share, to bless others through what we've been blessed with and what we struggled with. And now trying to give them the necessary tools and the options, the information so that they don't have to go through the same crap we went through, it's but it's establishing that whole complete prosperity around the whole life. And I remember, um, Keith Moore was talking about one time he was under the, the ministry of Kenneth Hagan for like 16 years, somewhere in that ballpark. And he learned about healing. And he said, one day he said, you know what? I just realized he's like all this stuff I've learned about healing. He's like, I think this will work for money too. So it's the same thing. That's what I'm talking about. It's a big prosperity. Ding. Yeah. Right. Ding. After 16 years. Minister, <laughs> it's, it's so like, nice. when it finally, <laughs> you finally go, Oh, that's who I am. But if you know who you are at two, you don't need 16 years to have the bells go off. Establishing crazy. the right foundation. Ugh. So okay. Important. Okay. Let's move on to number two. <clears throat> number two tip to make y'all kids rich is teach them how to earn money. Not how to make money, because that's the Hey, thing. you're good. You're learning. Because <laughs> who makes money? Only the Federal Reserve and then <laughs> the other one. I forget what the other one is. So Counterfeiters? One, no. Well, there's one place that makes the the dollars, mm -hmm. the dollar bills. More like the hundred dollar bills. There's another place that makes the coin, the Federal Reserve and the Mint, I think. Let's think about this one. When's the last time you used a coin to buy something in exchange? 
I just found two dimes. I didn't say it was the last time you found money. I said, when's the last time you used it for But no, exchange? when I found the two dimes, I looked at them like, when am I ever going to use this except when I find the month, when I find the change, or if I do get change, I take it to the coin thing to get a receipt where that receipt, I can either take the cash or it goes to my digital wallet. Like you were saying, it's all a bunch of numbers, right? Everything in the system is just a number. What's your number? Anyway, we say earn money because if you say <laughs> I'm making money, then you're counterfeit and you're doing something illegal. I'm still talking about my two dimes that I found. Okay, well, I'm okay. trying to get back to the teaching. Okay, now. let's go. <laughs> so we're teaching kids how to earn money <clears throat> because if you don't know how to earn money, how are you ever going to have money to save, give, invest? <laughs> it's like, right. So you have to be taught. So first of all, we've got to have the right mindset. Next step two, we got to get some money. So we got to teach kids how to earn money. How do you teach kids to earn money? My suggestion would be chores, possibly some type of reinforcement through an incentive reward program. Yeah. Reward and incentive program based on you have completed this task. So for me and my cousin, I mentioned last time that we started mowing lawns at eight years old. How do we do that? Knocking on doors. Hey man, you want your lawn mowed? This is J and J mowing here. It's like, I think that's you know. the good thing about like brownies and the Cub Scouts, right? You had to sell, sell door something. to door. Yeah. You had to sell something, right? We just had this, then those three <laughs> girls came and they were selling the chocolate bars. And we asked them what they're doing it for. And they were eating all the chocolate bars and they came to the door. Yeah, but what like, were they selling it for? They're selling for their sister. They're like, I'm. <laughs> their all, sister delegated. I'm like, does she like. She, she was like, a smart one. <laughs> she an entrepreneur. She like got subcontractors out. She got she all, totally of her, did. all of her kids and all but of But they were eating all. But that's the thing. Her subcontractors are eating all of the merchandise. Well, if they're having to pay for it, that was good. She probably, that's why she got, she's like, bring your friends who are a little bit heavier that can eat a lot. She was like, she might be really smart. Well, I think part of it was if you see them eating it at the door, you're like, oh, that looks good. So I'm going to buy some. So there's another tactic. It was like Very a smart. Jedi mind trick. So what do we do? We took one or two things and then we gave them a 20 for like two candy bars or something. And they were like, ah, we don't have any change. What'd you say? I don't remember. I tried to give him a lesson. <laughs> it tried to be a money lesson. What was the something. money lesson you tried to give me? And I was like, oh, <laughs> do you remember? Um, you said to me, okay, would you rather something about euros and dollars? And you were trying to make some, <laughs> I don't even know what kind of a lesson it was. And I said, I will take the euros because the euro right now is far greater. Oh yeah, greater. I was questioning you because you were going to France. Right. And I had euros and I had pesos and I had all this <laughs> stuff. I had a bag of money in the safe and I was like, hey, she's going there to see how much euros I got. So I asked you, I think, would you rather have this many euros or would you rather have a hundred dollar bill? Because I just wanted to see your knowledge on the conversion of... I was like, euros money. all day long, baby. Yeah, you knew they're worth more money. I was yeah. like, hey, you knew. <laughs> so I think you took both or something. I don't know. I got... Of course they took both. It didn't work out for me. So one way or another. <laughs> it didn't work out very well for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to teach and I got robbed. You know, whatever. It's like, what do you mean you got... Cool. You can't get robbed if you're offering up something. That's a joke. It's like making a bet. It's a joke. Right? So there are maybe some organizations that you can put your kids in that can help reinforce money making, money earning opportunities. Right, like the Cub Scouts or the Cub right. Scouts or so we mentioned, Eagle Scout. We mentioned chores, maybe right. coming up with some type of, it's been a long time since we've done this, so I'm just trying to kind of think out loud. Like an aid stands, uh, you can sell something, sim something you don't use, there's eBay. Yeah, we got some of that in, our, in the book, in right. one, of the, one of the books. Uh, we go through all these different steps of things that you can do, so it's like, I don't know if you do a lemonade stand anymore. <laughs> it's like the 1970s or whatever. I think there was like, some controversy of. It was like know, now people are gonna be like, "Do you have hand sanitizer? Did you sterilize your lemonade pot? Do you got? <laughs> are those cups recyclable? Are they plastic?" It's like. <laughs> I think scrolling through my social media, I saw some kid that had a beer stand, and some lady was like yelling at him because he had a beer stand. <laughs> he was like. I don't know. He's a kid. He's like Friday at 5.30. Yeah, he's, he's like, like had a line down the street. <laughs> he's smart, right? He's like beer stand. But then, yeah, you don't know what's going on, right? Who's, who's making the beer? What kind of beer is it? Anyway. So creating then some type of task list or coming up with some creative ways that maybe that your family can participate in together that, you know, maybe just something. Maybe you, 
if you're tennis players or pickleballers or some type of sport and you have old equipment, then how can you guys get together and take photos of that and sell that old, old equipment on eBay? And that's something that I've done for a lot of years is how much stuff do I give away? Like I usually clear my closet every six months. Okay, I haven't wore this, but I have something I haven't worn in six months, I give it away, even if it's brand new. So it's like shoes, shirts, equipment, whatever, we give away, give away, and we still do that. But what I've started doing is I've started doing some of the better things, if you will, I guess, or something that I feel that's more usable, like pickleball paddles that I've used that I only use maybe a few times. Selling those because then somebody who really wants that can get a really reduced price on, they can get it for half price, it's something that's barely used. So it's almost like, they're like, I got a good deal on this. So you can bless somebody in that opportunity from some perspective, rather than just stick it in a bag and putting it in the Goodwill and you not know if it ever even gets, gets, gets used. Right. So, you know, even thinking through those type of things on how you can bless somebody else with something that you have that you don't even use anymore. Right. How many times people have stuff in their attic or... Or being aware. So if you're a parent that has children that's in sports, being aware of needs around you because, you know, you don't know everyone's situation or story. I mean, and if you have a, an excess of stuff, you can go to like the coach or whatever. You can say, hey, I have this bag of stuff and whoever needs it, or you can create your own, you know, drive or giveaway or whatever. And it usually starts with being aware of what's going on in your inner circles because there's always a need somewhere. Yeah. Not always outside where you have to, you know, people are always criticizing. We have need, there's a need, there's needs everywhere, the poor you always have with you. So just be aware of how you can be a blessing in your inner circle. Okay, anything else for helping kids, to teach kids on earning money? This is always a great question for me, is even asking kids what they even think about money. Yeah. What is their opinion on it? They might not have any opinions on it until you start having conversations with them. And then they'll come up with creative ideas and you'll be like, oh my gosh, my child's five years old and listen to this great idea. There's entrepreneurs, there's kids on, social media right now they're making millions of dollars on their content of just yep. filming something you know you have to also monitor and have to be making sure that everything's on the up and up so another okay so that's how we can kind of help them i got a couple of things that as parents that suggestions recommendations to help them as well too one of those is lead by example Absolutely. Don't be. A I would lazy. say that's number one. Don't, don't be <laughs> lazy ass sitting on the couch and trying to tell your kid to go out and earn some money and you don't even want to get off the couch yourself. Right. So, and that's, I always had good examples in my life of the men hustling, men always working. <laughs> and then we talked a little about this last time is that my one stepfather made me work at a start at like age eight from the time I got home from school until the time I went to bed seven days a week, all those times, even when I was home on the weekend, it wasn't about going out and playing. I worked from the morning until the nighttime. So I was taught how to work. So my point was with that is that <clears throat> one thing that I noticed a lot of with some of my growing up is that kids did yard work, you know, and even at like young ages, kids were opera. I mean, me and my cousin, seven, eight, were running weed eaters and lawn mowers and all that stuff. And you know, my friends, tree trimmers and all that type of stuff, it's like, oh no, it's too dangerous for them. No, put that tool in their hand, <laughs> teach them how to use it, teach get their butts it. out there, get them using it, teach them right. how to do it right. right. You know, so it can start at home just on those simple things. Hey man, snow on that driveway, let's go out and do this. You know, I ran a, I ran a uh, snow blower <laughs> in the mountains at age like nine, you know, <laughs> right. it's like blowing snow right. in the middle of winter and they're freezing. It's like kids are okay to do that kind of stuff. Right. It's not like we're running some sweatshop in the middle of China <laughs> and making them work and not go to school and not feeding anything. It's like, no, it's okay to teach them how to do that stuff. Right. It's okay. So that's like, maybe that's like one of the foundation, teach them how to work at home, doing all the stuff to help. Even to cooking, do. you can apply the same thing. Cooking, cleaning, cooking, loading cleaning, the dishwasher, yeah, unloading the Just dishwasher. Just basic life skills of, you know, this is, this is, these are the things you need to live. Yeah, participate in everything. Yeah, <laughs> and you can provide a service for everything that's needed to live for anyone. I mean, there's dog pooper scoopers that have made a lucrative business. If you don't want to scoop the poop, you can call this person and they'll come and they'll do it for you. I mean, talk business. about, <laughs> it's a great business. How many times I used to have those trash cans out back 
that were just with the dog poop. Remember, because we haven't had dogs for six months or so, and we had dogs for 20 years. Yeah. That when you take that dog poop out of the trash can once a week, what that smells like, ooh, I can smell it right now. Oh, gosh. Okay, next subject. So, yeah, you can have your kids throw that dog poop out there you go. <laughs> or scoop the poop, right? Earn some money. Well, and how many times would you do that? Parents, I want a dog. <laughs> it's like, okay, you're going to feed it, you're going to scoop the poop, you're going to walk it. Okay, okay. And then how many times did you walk the dog, feed the dog, or scoop the poop? Less than 1% of the time. And we didn't enforce it. And she said she'd do it. So we had a responsibility to ourselves to enforce it. To enforce right. it. And we didn't follow through with it. That's so not us. Yeah, well, that's yeah. my whole point. Parents got to follow through. They do. You know, you got to be, oh, they're too young. Or it's like, you know what? They can own the dishwasher, get a stool or a chair and get the plates from the bottom and then step on the chair and then step to that. I mean, set up something, wait for them and do it. Be creative. Right. You know, so they're too little. They're too short. They're too young. Don't make excuses. Right. That's my one point. Okay. So two is... How to earn some how money. To earn some money. <laughs> Lots of ways. You're going to have to get creative and you're going to have to do stuff that's going to work than your family. Yeah, you can even Google, how do I get my toddler to earn money? And I'm sure a <laughs> million things, you, you know, will pop up. Use AI. Yeah, use <laughs> we'll AI. Give a, we'll give you a whole list of uh, You're checklists. five, <laughs> you've got your own AI company that's <clears throat> writing letters to whatever. Okay, so number one, gotta get the right mindset. Number two, we're gonna teach them how to earn money. Number three, save some money. Okay. I'm not going to go into the details of money management. I was already at spend. Money. Yeah. See, I'm not going into that one. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to make that one of the tips because that's like a whole subject on its own. So I'm leaving spending and managing money out of this, even though it's very, very important. It's so important. That it actually needs its own podcast, its own topic. Right. So we have number one mindset. Number two, how to earn. Number three is how to save because once we get the money in, then we need to save a little bit of it. Why do we need to save it? Because we need to have some type of a little bit of a nest, a nest egg, uh, just some collateral that we can have in a time of need, because I think that's an important part of setting the mindset is having that, that backup that you need, that savings. And savings is, is different than investing. We're gonna talk about investing, it's gonna be tip five moving ahead. But that saving is an important part of setting the mindset of the first step before I can even invest. It's just, I gotta take, I get, if I get $10, I gotta take a dollar out and put it aside for myself, pay myself first. And a lot of good investors will always say, pay yourself first. That's the old thing that my stepfather's always told me, always told me, always reinsured, pay yourself first. And it that is, so is savings. Pay yourself first. Yes, it's saving, but then saving leads to investing because then you want to get your money working for you. But you have to, before you can get to investing, you have to just learn, I got to take some out and pay myself, which is basically, I got to take some out and move it to the side. That's step one. Right. Because the first thing is that I got some money. I got some dollars. Let's go spend. Woohoo! That's where you wanted to get into that already. Okay. Yeah. Let's spend it, man. Tell me how to spend it. Tell me how to do it right. So I do it right. But when can I go to the mall? So we have to change that. We have to, we have to get this. I know heavy, heavy sign here, Mark. I have to change that. So I'll pay myself we, first. <laughs> we have I to will pay myself first. There you go. Wait, I'm faith comes I by will hearing pay myself first. And even hearing your own, sometimes you got to get it out of your own mouth is the most important thing. It's not just about hearing from others, but a lot of times we got to get it out of your mouth. And that's why when I get up first thing every morning, what I do, I start my declarations. What am I doing? I'm saying those things. I'm calling those things that be not. I'm reinforcing you're the righteousness in God. You're the righteousness in God in Christ Jesus. You are rich. You are righteous. You are wealthy. You are healthy. Saying all those things. I am blessed going in. I am blessed going out. All those things. I'm reassuring myself on those things. So what are we doing with this first step of saving is that we're, we're, establishing that foundation of that paying yourself, setting some aside to do something else with it other than, uh, other than spending it. Okay. So why is that so important? Well, one statistic that we know that we share and I'm taught on is that 80% of people don't have a thousand dollars saved. 80%, 80% of Americans do not have a thousand dollars. What happens when, washing machine breaks, the car breaks down. Well, if you don't have that, then you don't have that, that backup. So then what does that do? That creates a, a stressful situation 
because then you either have to use a credit card because you don't have the money to do it, which means now you're in debt and you're paying 20 something percent on that credit, which then adds additional stress onto your financial situation and onto your mind. And it just, just makes things worse. It just, it creates a snowball. Okay. It creates a snowball <laughs> I, I'm still stuck on just save some money, just save some okay. money. <laughs> so, okay. So where do we put that? We're gonna, right. We're gonna so save some money. I get the money. And then I can, uh, well, and what I do is I get into my app, I transfer the money, and then I set some aside into another app or another thing, and then I put my tithe, save, invest, give. I kind of go through that yeah. process. Um, but what if they don't? What if someone is still okay, working well that, with dollars? Okay, that's a very good point. So it's going to depend on where your child is at and do they have any type of those systems in place? Right. So maybe if you're saying, well, my kid's 10, I'm starting from scratch with my kid from 10, but he already has some digital currency in whatever form. Maybe he's got a savings account. Maybe he's got this. Well, I don't know what kids use, but this, that was one of my challenges in teaching Paris on how to manage her money with her business is doing all these things through QuickBooks and through all these other software platforms that I use in my business that make a lot of sense to me, but she just is never like, never got through her. She had these other ways, these apps and these ways of how that she can logically track and do this type of stuff. And it wasn't my way. So, so then so, maybe it is sitting down with your child and looking at the different options and then letting them pick what, what's easy for them. Could be, or <clears throat> what I was going to say is, where are they at from an age perspective, what they have. Maybe if they're two or three in that thing, there's, I've seen a lot of different types of very simple systems um, where we went and uh, talked to Corey, who's a wealth manager. Mm -hmm. He's the manager of a wealth management company. They actually had these tools for kids and they are plastic, like little plastic containers. And one said save, one said spend, and one said invest. So when you get the $10 in, you determine what's gonna go where. <clears throat> okay, I'm saving a dollar, um, investing a dollar, and the rest goes into my spin. And when I wanna go spend, then I have this in this container that I can take out, and I have this in this savings. And, and to me, that is a good way for kids that are very it's young. It's visual, very they can see the blocks, they see what each of these are. Again, you can do the same way, digital with the app, where you can see your apps and doing the same thing, drawing money into each of those things. I think that the, the system with the containers or even maybe it's envelopes. You don't have to have some fancy containers. It can be envelopes and the envelope is just written on there. Save, spend, invest. And it's just putting it in there and you can see that in there. You can take, you can see the money if it's a clear thing or you can take it out of the envelope and you can see it's tangible. And I think that's good it's, you can feel it, you can see it. So it helps to like establish in the mind these things because you can first see it because a lot of times when you can't see it in a digital format, <clears throat> it's not as personable as being right here. Right. And that's why I like to have some money, some cash in your safe at home or under your bed or wherever you put your money for like, that's real emergency stuff. <laughs> you know, if, if everything blows up and the only, there's no, the banks are down or whatever, and you only got some currency, then you've got that. <clears throat> that's not that's not my point. You know, Get I like your gold bars. You know, you know, I like yeah. If you got gold, you got silver. I mean, it's backup right. for if the whole system goes or just electricity goes down and the whole system or whatever, whatever you have a backup. But the point I'm trying to make with it is that I don't have it just for that. So I like to go and open it up and unzip it and pull it out, and look at it and count it. And I like to play with it. It's right. like it's tangible right. to me. And it's like hey, I've worked. It's a hard. good manifestation technique too. I've worked hard. Yeah. Some, Seeing sometimes visual. I'll take take it and sit it on my desk when I'm working sometimes and it will remind me of the scripture and then I go Matthew oh 6. thank that's you that's why I gotta be careful when I have it out there because it will disappear and it wasn't GPS man or somebody is my wife but I like to visualize that because then I declare that that money is chasing me down because that's what Matthew 6 says do not worry do not worry about what you're gonna eat what you're gonna wear don't worry about all these things seek ye first my kingdom my righteousness and all of these things shall come after you. All these things are going to come when you know you're righteous, when you know that he's already taken care of it for you. They start being The things money. are attracted to you. So yeah. that reminds me of that, that money is attracted to me, not because I'm just 
working and toiling and that's why it's stuff. like a magnet i just go Ooh. that's a good decoration too i'm a money magnet money magnet I'm a money magnet just, just, just sit on a blessing bless be a blessing bless amen crepo dollar that's old school <laughs> that is old school crepo. old school that's like 20 years and see it's still in you it's still in me it's still in yeah. me too and i still yeah. i was making that declaration this money. morning coming to <laughs> me Leroy Thompson. now Leroy yeah, like, he's know. so crazy so establishing some type of system that's going to work for your kid so they can see it touch it feel it whether whatever platform where however maybe that may be but establishing some different variations that are very simplistic okay I like that save okay four number four teach them how to give money Ooh. Because what we talked about last time is that... I think first you need to teach them how to just give something. Like give well, a toy. And, which is part of and it. And that can be what we talked about last time. It's like when a kid has a toy when they're... I mean, even a toddler, they don't even talk yet. It's like, you got this. And the other kid tries to take it out of his hand. Like, yeah, my, my. It's like, they're upset. They're crying because what they just had was taken away. It's not when the other kid pulls it, they go, oh, yes. I graciously give this to thee because I'm a child of the most high God. It's not that. That has to be taught. See, this in the same way with your stack of money when I come into the I'm office. I'm still learning. <laughs> I'm still learning. You should say, I giveth unto thee. <laughs> Avail yourself to my yes. safe of riches. Because the more money that goes out, the more money will come in under grace in perfect ways. Yes. I should go <laughs> Jesus name. sit in the corner right now and say that to myself over and over. I shall see? freely give to thy wife. See. I shall freely give to thy wife. Amen. <laughs> that is the perfect prayer. Okay. <laughs> How do we always give back to these marriage <laughs> vows and marriage <laughs> counseling? Okay. So we're teaching how to give. Okay. The reason why I think it's important teach how people to give is not this because you are helping other people out and you're doing you're blessing other people and you're doing that and that's great that's that's part of the reason why you do give but more importantly than that and we're back to mindset again is that you're establishing a mindset of your relationship with money so just like you we were just telling me hey I need I still need to work on my relationship because what am I trying to do I'm trying to hold on to my stack of money so you don't take it all <laughs> You know, but here's the one thing if you and here's just a little lesson in that if you said to me All that I have is yours. Go ahead and take it. I would probably not even take it So first Timothy having the right relationship is a scripture first Timothy two and three I think of, I don't know first Timothy. Okay, you can put it on the bottom. All right. I just put that in says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And it gets misquoted all the time that money is the root of all evil. It's not money. We talked about this last time as well, too. It's the love of money. What is the love of money? It's the wrong relationship with money, meaning that you love your money more than you love people, period. So then that still, even when you have your money, it's like, I want to hold on to it. Why do people want to hold on to it? Because they don't have the foundation from a mental and spiritual perspective that they don't know the things that when I sow, when I give, it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, run over, shall men give to my bosom. Or whoever sows much gets much, but whoever is stingy with much is not going to get nothing. So it's about establishing that type of thing. So my whole point is establishing a mindset that's proper with money so that money doesn't control you. You control me. I don't know why I have to keep picking up my phone as money. I should have brought a stack of money in here. You should have. I could have. With that then I would have said. So the whole thing you. is, well, maybe that's probably why I was still scared. You can take <laughs> my whole stack of money. So we're still working through this. <laughs> Point is that we have to have the right understanding of what money is for. Money is to serve us. Money is to be used for us to use it to do something with. We should not be controlled by money on the decisions that we make. We should be controlling money. And that's a process. And I think you have to learn that at a really young age. Well, that's the whole thing. It's like, because well, that's just... ingrained in you. Like well, you said, to earn money. Okay. So you're working, you think I've got to earn money. I got to earn money. I got to earn money. I got to work to do something, but you can also manifest money that you didn't earn and you didn't deserve because that's under grace and in perfect ways that well, will transfer. come. 
wealth transfer, absolutely. Debt cancellation. And that's those are other things that we haven't even tapped into. Yeah, well, anyway. it was the one teaching that we did that we got from George Pearson from Kenneth Copeland Ministry, 126 ways of supernatural increase or something like that, or 126. 132 or something. Yeah, 100, 132, 120, whatever it was, but there was 136 or 132 scriptures on how to get supernatural increase yeah. is what it was. And so all those different ways, so the 132, 100, whatever it is, 100 something <laughs> ways that you can get money that's not earning money. <laughs> you know, animals, which, which is a like whole the fish, another thing. Birds, you know, sending provision. I mean, we could go on with these other things in the Bible, which but, okay. it would be really fun to tap into those. And, and this is the whole thing that we're doing with what we're doing with the books and with the podcast is trying to teach the kids early on yeah. how to do that. So what if you taught kids from a very early age, 120 some ways on how to get supernatural increase instead of being influenced by what the world teaches about. There's a downturn and there's inflation and there's this and they hear that, the parents hear it and the parents are talking about it and they're, well, you can't have that because there's inflation right now. And there's an economic downturn and my job might be subject to cancellation and firing and you know, so hearing all that so instead, of, instead of talking about Supernatural, supernatural increase provision. Yeah, yeah, and provision. You know? So it goes back to establishing the mindset. All I have is this coin and it's our last coin. And so the priest took the coin and threw it out the window. He said, now you have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now you got no choice now to trust got, God. Yeah, now you have no choice <laughs> to trust God. Well, sure enough, within hours, knocked at the door and all this food was brought to them. Well, that's the... Supernatural. So God tells... Elijah, go to this, this widow's gonna provide for you. First he sends, sends him to the brook and the ravens. And you know he's got the brooks because it's a time of famine, it's a time of drought, so the brooks provide the water mm -hmm. and the ravens provide the food. That was his supernatural provision that he did not have to work for. The next place he had to go was to see the widow. And the widow, what does she say, is that I'm gathering up some sticks and I have this last bit of meal so that I can cook it for me and my son so we can die. <laughs> So you, 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 that's, you're in a bad state when you're like, it'd be like, a, I'm gonna open the refrigerator, we got one bite left, and we are completely, we're not just famished, we are so malnutritioned that even this last bite, this little bit of what we have in the refrigerator is not gonna save us, we're gonna eat it, we're gonna die. We're done. That's what she was basically saying. And that's who the Lord told Elijah to go, and she's gonna take care of you. He's like, how does that even make sense? It doesn't. You know, but the whole thing is that when she did, Elijah says, yeah, okay, cook and give it to me. Yeah. What, <laughs> if a, ball. what if a, what if a <laughs> pastor did that, walked up to some family Almost getting ready to go, right? like, you know, yeah, hey, what do you got? I just got this, I'm gonna eat this, I'm gonna die. Yeah, give it to me, I'm gonna help you out here. It'd be like, oh, blast to me, is like the world would say, <laughs> this guy is like, He's a false creature. Look at that. See, he's just trying to get people's money. He's just trying to get people's money. That's all he's trying to do. But what's he uh. trying to do? He's trying to get something in them. And that's what Elijah did. So what happened is that she gave it to him. He ate it. And he said, then bring me some water too. <laughs> he was like, I'm thirsty. I'm going to get this cake down. And he brought it to her. And what happened <laughs> is that her, her, what the, her, her meal and her oil did not fail. And they lived for a long time. But not only did he insult her livelihood, he insulted her cooking. He insulted her livelihood, give it to me, and then give me some water. He insulted her cooking because he had to choke oh, it down. Yeah, anyway, I'm just saying, yeah, if you, you could, it's, it's okay, how you yeah. see it, yeah, that's, right? That's your teaching, you can do it however you want. He was so offensive, but go on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> An opportunity. Your offense is your opportunity waiting to happen. And then what happened? There, the oil they, wouldn't stop. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stop. And it was the same thing with the Go collect the, the lady jars, who, right? Who her husband died and know the creditors. The creditors were coming to take her two sons as slaves. And Elijah was sent to help her out. And he's like, what do you got? Once again, he didn't say, I am here, a man of God, and I bring this provision for you to help you. What do he say? Hey, what do you got? What do you got? What you got, girl? She's like, I just got this little bit of oil. Once again, she just had a little something. Right. Little something, what'd he say? He said, go get the jars, get as many as you can, go borrow the jars. Go borrow the jars. That's a whole nother teaching That's itself. That's a whole other That could go with like leveraging. Yeah. He said, go get the jars. And she said that they poured until they ran out of jars. Not because they ran out of oil. She said, I just got this little bit of oil. Supernaturally, that oil continued to pour. Right. Until, until they had no had more had containers. No more containers. Until it filled up what she had the capacity to receive. 
Ooh, that's good too. That's good. That's anyway. Good. But, and so that goes back to when people say, I don't have anything to give. How many people honestly say that? I, I don't have anything to give. Well, and this you, is, and you this, got something. And this is what we're talking about. So we're teaching how to change right. the child's mindset in a form of giving. Right. So it's not always even about what you got. We got the, we got the giving container. We we're just mm -hmm. talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The giving containers just got a little bit. And then, hey, we're going to help this family. Well, what is this? This is so little. How is this going to work? Because well, now the disciples said when they were going to feed the multitudes, 5,000 plus the what women and children. What is this among so many? <laughs> when they had a little kid, he brought two, two loaves and his, or two fish and his five loaves or whatever. And the disciples, her first thing was, what is this amount? So many. Not Jesus, we know you because we walked with you and we know you're going to do something amazing here. Let's go, Jesus. What they do? What is this amongst so many? What they're looking at, their container. So they're looking at from a worldly perspective. Right. So that's about establishing the mindset about our kids on how to give, but not just looking at what we have in our hands, but what we can do when we give on that, how God can take it and multiply it. And the first thing he did was he gave thanks. He looked up and he gave thanks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And that's just the whole thing. And to him who has, more will be given. Yeah. And, and people don't like that. <laughs> right. It's like, People think, well, why do they need more? Well, it's like socialism. Right. Let's take from the rich and distribute it equally to the poor. Or sometimes I even hear, I was just watching it. I was standing with you. I was watching this guy. He was preaching on this and I wanted to see just what does he have to say about this? He was basically saying that he lived a very minimal life. I just have a house big enough to live. I drive old cars. I just have enough to get by. And it's not right for these other people who have this stuff. He's giving the example of somebody who had a $2 million mansion and a BMW. And that was his comparison. That guy doesn't need to have that is what he was saying. He should have what I have. So he should take that money and give that money. I don't know if he's saying to me or my church or whatever. <laughs> if you want to live that way, that's great. That's fine. Right. Just like, you know, if people want to continue to wear a mask after COVID, hey, you, I, I'm fine with it. You, you wear a mask every day, all the time for the rest of your life. I don't care. Just don't make me wear it. Let me do my thing. Same thing. You want to live in that little house and do that stuff. That's great. I'm fine. Don't criticize me for what I have that I have. A big and house. then the audacity to say, well, then give it to me because I'm going to do something with it. It's, it's, it's so contradictory. Point is, is that, what was the point? To him who has more will be given. That's the thing. So it's about from a, a mindset of a perception of as you continue to increase and grow, then that's almost like you're passing somewhat of a test to show that you can handle more. And I, only... I, I think that's what I've noticed in our life is as far as how we keep increasing, increasing, increasing is that we establish the mindset and the ability to be able to manage that wealth and properly dis distribute it from a perception or from, uh, from a place of being divinely directed because sometimes if it comes in too quick for some people, I'm not against, I'm not, we just talked about supernatural increase and in having this thing is that you sometimes have to learn things in steps for it to really, to be established. And it's just like lifting weights. If I go and I start lifting weights and let's just say I do hundred pounds and I can lift hundred pounds, that's it. But my goal is 200 pounds. I don't go hundred and the next day I go to the 200. I got to go to 105. And once I pass that test I've developed in that, I can go to 110 and I can do that progression. Sometimes I think in our finances and in our lives, those type of things are necessary. Can we skip certain things supernaturally? Absolutely. But I think that there needs to be an established progression, like a plan, if you will, of how you go about doing that. And again, like you said, it's divinely being divinely directed on what's going to be best for you. Um, but even us, when, we were doing our ministry work on the DL and we were flying to places. We actually had to believe what we were going to give was going to be in our account before we left. So we had to see it. We had to have faith to know that that money was going to be there before we left. And in some instances, it wasn't even all the way there when we, I think it was all, all the time because we wouldn't have written a check without it being there 100%. Oh, really? Do I need to remind you? <laughs> Do you know where I'm going? <laughs> There's a number of times where we 
paid off people's entire debt, paid for their kids to go to college for a year, paid for rent for nine, all these different things that we were led to do and, and to give to people. And how many times do we do it? It was the exact amount that they were praying for. Exact. Or we paid off the one family's debt and it was the exact amount to pay off their entire debt. So, you know, that's when you know you're being divided directly. And that's that kind of faith to faith as you learn, as you learn how to give. And that's kind of my point that I'm making with this is that we went from step to step, faith to faith on that giving perspective. But you have to step out. But you have to start somewhere too. Right. And you have to be directed. So the whole point is teaching kids to give. It's a step by step process. But it's, a, it's an important mindset that needs to be established from a giving perspective instead of just, just hoarding it all. It's the right relationship with money. And I think it's that right giving is the best thing to establish a right relationship with money. Because as long as you can freely give, you're not gonna be, it's mine, I love money, I do that. As long as you're giving good, you're gonna have the right relationship, period. Right, that's good. Number five. How to invest money? Probably the stock market, probably, cryptocurrencies, other it, businesses. Yeah. Invest in yourself. Yeah. Ideas that you can relate to, businesses that you can relate to. Yeah, those are all great things. But it's like, okay, this is what I've found. And when we're teaching people or just talking to people, is that probably investing becomes the most place where people lack the most knowledge. So it becomes the most complicated. They have no idea. It seems people. like it's out there somewhere and shouldn't really be tapped into until you're much older. I mean, that's just being raised in the 70s, how yeah. I thought about money and investing, because it was never, ever taught to us investing money. Well, in the same It was like, and that's what, what do you people mean? do it, or they think, oh, or even if you have somebody that says, hey, you should be investing in for your retirement, right. which we don't. Then you think, we're retirement, I'm, yeah. you know. 20, 30, you, 20, 30 you're invincible. Yeah. It's not, that's yeah. such a far way down the road. I don't even need to be thinking right now. I'm just trying to figure out how to pay my bills right now. We're right. talking about retirement. So that's why we're talking about the containers, the envelopes, whatever it is, right. and teaching them that save, spend, and invest. Because you're implementing that no matter how small it is, people, and that's one of the things. I don't have enough money to give. I don't have enough money to save. I don't have enough money to invest. That's why you need to break those mindsets and establish the mindsets. When I get the $10, one, two, three, or however that's broken down, you're doing something out of each one, no matter how small it is. Right. So that, that way, and we did that with our daughter. And so when she started making, when she was, you know, the gross income over a million dollars of her first business and doing that now, it's like, it's like established. <laughs> and it's like, I'm in the point now where like I have a, have a discussion with her on investing is that, hey, be careful not to overinvest is what I was just saying, because you like can get almost where you have too much money. I was like, I just, what I told her was like, you gotta have enough capital reserve to run your business, you know, to, to run your, oh, I've got enough to do that. I was like thinking, okay, yeah, well I got this coming and I got that coming. I was like, okay, yeah, it's true. It's probably, she's probably right. But, but I think you still, you can get out of balance even with whatever it is that you're doing. So the whole thing is that just getting to a place where it's just ingrained in you that you're doing that because then once you start earning money at a higher rate, then you automatically do that. So what you don't do, go do is you don't go, okay, I'm gonna get a home mortgage and I got out of college and I got my scooting loan debts and I'm making this amount of money, making a hundred grand and I'm gonna do a house I can get this much and I can get a car loan I can do this much and this much for my family and that's all I got. <laughs> it should be, okay, I'm gonna make a hundred grand, I'm gonna tithe 10 grand, I'm gonna save X percentage, and then I'm gonna invest 10%, whatever that may be. The rest is the spend. So you'll think from that mindset versus is just, hey, money's coming in and whatever. So it's the investment is setting the mindset once again. We're not really getting to the depth of where's it gonna go, all the different things that you've said. How am I gonna do that? You know, and we're talking, you know, recently just with ours, like leveraging debt to invest. You know, what is that? Okay, you teach people how to stay out of debt. That's a whole order. other subject. You know, infinite banking, life insurance, all these things, stock market, and you've got all your stuff diversified and all these things, and right. all of a sudden it becomes complicated. So with that, if that's, if you're an adult and you're in that place, we talked about this last time, where there, are, where you have a mini counselors, there's victory, get some help. Right. <laughs> you gotta get some help. Or you like know? you said, the books, right? You were reading some really good books on investing and we can well, put that information below that you, you know, our 
that, those who are that, listening can figure out books that speak to them or you know at least start somewhere at least read one page a day so what are you doing by reading expanding your capacity to receive what are you gaining knowledge, knowledge. wisdom we talked about last time book of Isaiah 4 and 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge it means you get jacked up because you stupid <laughs> so my CT paraphrase of that. CT handbook for so living. So how do you go against that? You get knowledge. How do you get knowledge? Reading books, listening to podcasts, doing whatever it is, right. getting around people who know more than you know about it, getting a wealth manager depending on where you're at, talking to friends or family members who have invested. And that was the first step for us, just listening to my stepdad on saying, here's what you need to do. And even though it took 10 years for him to keep beating me over the head before me finally get it in, I finally started doing it. And Finally so works, it's so but, much easier when they're kids. You just, this is what you do. Because I was already conformed to the world thinking I didn't need to do yeah, it yet. And I, I need to do this first to earn this money to get this and get this on track and get that on track and to get more of this and more of that. And then I'll start investing. And so it's the whole thing. So we're going all back. Said all everything we said today. Because every one of these steps is really establishing the right mindset right. in a child and then reinforcing that through the knowledge that you're gonna give them. Do it now so you don't have to play catch up. Yeah. Because playing catch up sucks. Yeah. Well, I'll give you just an example of where, with me personally, where I'm at with my life insurance policy and where our daughter that I started just recently, this new life insurance policy, that I started 57 and our daughter started at 25 the differences of when it's I look nuts. at the charts, it's nuts. difference of the compounding interest of a dollar from an investment perspective, whatever you put it in. Yeah. Even if it's just a basic savings account, CD, money mark, whatever it may be, stocks, the compounding interest, that money working for you over that period of time is the most valuable thing that you can have from an investment. Time, time is that. Time is your friend. <laughs> time is going to help you. And it can be the difference of between like, me and our daughter, hundreds of millions it's nuts. at the same time point. Like at my chart at 80 years old and her at 80 years old, it's literally the difference of hundreds million. And that is leaving an inheritance for your children's children. And that's what's so awesome. And I just emailed her this morning and I said, you're a multi-million dollar woman. I put the, the number <laughs> amount to that as an encouragement. Because right. she did something that was I thought was really good by doing that. And then I was like, here now, this is what this is worth you know, to your kids. And already, even at age 25, she's already left an inheritance to her children's children. So she's already left an inheritance, not only to her own kids, but to her and she has no kids. grandkids. And she ain't even married. She's already done it. That's like, we're 50 and we're still like, we're still working on this. We just have this kind of, what, you know, what were we right. talking about the other day? And I was like, I was trying to break down net worth to you and so we were kind of going through in our minds like i had a pretty good idea but then i was trying to explain it to you and what we're <laughs> worth from that and it's like you know it's nowhere near what our daughter's going to to be you know and and why is that starting them early start them period early. Whole, so important. whole thing we'll talk about here you know what's so funny is that you know because she's a public figure has a public profile being out there, people think they know what her life is like, or they think they know. Yeah, people make comments, you know, whether good or bad, indifferent, ugly, it's all out there. If, you, if you're gonna put, I mean, even people will have comments about what we're doing on our podcast. No, this, that, whatever, whatever. Nobody knows, no, you don't know, nobody knows. But they had commented on Paris that, she, oh, she's a trust fund baby or something like that. And I was laughing so hard because if only she was a trust fund baby, but her ingenuity, her business skills, us putting her on the right path, instilling the, these concepts in her to her mind, now she can be a blessing to enable to leave her children a nice trust fund, but she's worked the whole, the system, right? In order that she can then be a blessing. And I just had to laugh because it's been a process for us. She's like, been doing all these things. She's been things doing all of these from, things. From age six <laughs> and then finance wise since age eight to get to the place where what we just said, and yeah. that's our testimony. Right. We talked about that last time. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, right. how powerful testimony. That's all we're doing. We're not bragging on our family. 
We're not bragging on we're such great parents. We're not bragging on our kid is so talented. But the concept of people <clears throat> of just oh they must just have gotten all this money and they're just like spending all this money. Well, that's sometimes even that will like like people can't understand how you can get there. Like, how do you get there? Like, and that's envious. That's somebody projecting, I wish I had, I wish I had. But if you at two can teach this, you will not wish you had, you will then be. You will be this person with amassing all of this wealth. Because it's so easy when you lay it all out. And that's our testimony. That's it. <laughs> Good <laughs> that night. You can take this. You can take what we're saying. You can take the knowledge that we're giving you. You can take these books, you can take these teachings, and you can use it too, and you can do it too. Because the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. Right. So what he's done for me, he'll do for you. Right. And even what if you're late to them, the party, the one scripture, the one guy who ended up late got the same day wage as the yeah. one who started early. So you can have supernatural favor and have the same wage yeah. as the one guy who showed up so late. So don't use the excuse, which what I say earlier, an excuse is lying to yourself. Don't right. use the excuse. I'm too old, it's I'm too, too broke, late. I'm too this, yeah. I'm too that, I'm too ugly, I'm too fat, whatever, I'm not talented enough, I'm not knowledgeable enough, I never went to school, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, right. I get up on the wrong side of the bed, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're all excuses. It doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. You can step into this at any time and change your life. Lives can be transformed. Then you can let the 100 and something, 20, 20, 126, 130, I need to get that. Supernatural ways of increase go to yeah. work in your life. Stop longing and start being. Amen. Amen. It's all there. The whole Money Mike and the Gang series, everything from money is easy, saving is easy, giving is easy, and saying no to debt. Everything that we just talked about, these tips are in every single one of the books. What we're going to do to continue to change the lives, not only of our children, but also in the lives of others, ourselves and others around us to increase more and more. And that's what the abundant life's all about. We yeah. said it's that full spectrum right. of life prosperity. And that's what we're here to talk about on the abundant life is how to get the people who are listening that whole abundant life. Because who said it? Jesus said it. <laughs> John Tintin, I have come so you may have life and have it in abundance. He said it. I'm taking it. Amen. Hook, line, and sinker. Till next time. Peace out. Hey, kids. It's Money Mike. I'm lean, I'm green, and I'm a money machine. Welcome to my new book, Money is Easy, where I branch out with glee, revealing the message, money is as easy as counting one, two, three. This is my first book in the Money Mike and the Gang four book series, where I get together with my good friends and reveal hidden secrets in my tree leaves that pay dividends. I'll teach you three simple steps on how to get rich so you can tell a friend and also help their lives to be enriched. So check out my new book and you will see that money really is easy. As easy as counting one, two, three.